In just about four hours, Tropical Storm Debbie dumped 10 inches of rain on St. Lucia, triggering landslides and flooding never experienced before. The storm charted a course through the middle of the island, entering through Denry on the east, saturating Fosse Jacques and exiting through Ancillary on the west coast. In Denry, it forced residents along High Street to think again about living in between dangers. On one side, the floodwaters, to the east, the Atlantic. In Ancillary, the village is sandwiched between two rivers, channeling the raging waters of the interior. And to add to the worries, there is a third river running down the middle. But the distress was in Lago Cola, the name a part of translation of Cholera Lagoon. Those old enough remember. Only quick action saved lives and prevented health hazards. In Fonce Jacques, three lives were lost, and there were many narrow escapes. Today, there is the very real fear of a massive landslide on a scale so big it could bury the St. James and St. Philip's Church. Tonight, the story of the three communities, a people in distress. The West Coast village of Ancillary one time depended quite heavily on fishing. The community was animated when the boats came in with the day's catch. Today, there is still an excitement, but increasingly it's an economic challenge to bring an edge to the percent just for survival. But one day in September 1994, Ancillary found itself fighting for its very survival. All escape routes were shut as rivers to the south and north overflowed their banks and overwhelmed the homes of those in its path. The sea to the west provided no escape. <laughs> I think um, if we had experienced um, the, the storm, like let's say around midnight, I think we, we, we would have had um, casualties in terms of, of, of um, um, deaths. But luckily for us, you know, at least it was around 5.30 in the morning, so um, we, had, we had some light um, at least to rescue people and um, at least to know exactly where the dangerous areas were. To the south, the flooding was just as intense. Gregory John is today standing on the spot where his house stood until early September 10th, 1984, when the river overflowed its banks. Everywhere was flood, about 10 feet or 12 feet high water, hunting, and bushes, everything was going down, woods, stones, everything. What condition was the house in at the time? Well, the condition of the house, it was inside, it was at full up of water and everything like that. Water had gone inside it already. So when I see that, I had to, to take out from the, um, from the house and then I had to lift. So you didn't have them take anything with you? No, nothing, nothing. All my money, everything, everything went out. My clothes in, everything, my shoes, everything, my bank book, everything had gone. John's house was swept down river and demolished when it hit the bridge in the full view of bystanders. It seemed no one in the community was spared. When the river receded, it left behind inches of mud in the homes of many people. Others still had to contend with stagnant water and trapped by tons of debris. Tropical storm Debbie and its devastation in Ancillary forced unprecedented interest in disaster management. The very active association for development was the logical launch pad for the disaster preparedness committee. But interest waned just as the pictures faded. As time went by, it would seem as if um, generally people be lapsed into uh, some form of complacency because I know the Disaster Preventers Committee had to do some sensitization prior to the um, hurricane season that is um, for this year and even then we got the, the, the feeling that the people were not too concerned in terms of getting themselves prepared for a possible disaster. 
George Williams was directly in charge of handling disaster management immediately after the passage of Tropical Storm Debbie. He too has noticed complacency among villagers, but he says it could be mistaken for public confidence in the disaster preparedness committee. They assume well, you know, I mean, these guys have always been working, and if anything happens to us, they'll take care of us, you know. So therefore, everybody will depend on five of us more or less to carry whatever disaster we, we encounter in the village. Since Debbie, the Disaster Preparedness Committee has been refined with responsible members of the community put in charge of various aspects of disaster management. We now have some subcommittees in place. Um, we are now trying to fine-tune you know, things in terms of our action plan. And uh, what we have at the moment is that if something, say, like a a similar situation like Debbie were to occur, we, we have certain measures where people will know where they will have to go and the, the different chairpersons of the committees will meet and we would have, um, we have some form of kind of plan in place, but not a very comprehensive one, I must say. In fact, we are still working on it. There is a subcommittee responsible for uh, rescue, evacuation, transportation and first aid. There's also a committee, a subcommittee responsible for communication and information. Uh, there's a committee responsible for shelter management, clothing, feeding, and food distribution. All that preparation is for the next disaster, if and when it happens. But the discomfort caused by Debbie remains. Joseph at Joseph can only look on helplessly at the spot he once called home. I suppose it would be difficult trying to move people away from the bank. Well, you see, the difficulty lies in the whole question of getting a um, place to re relocate them. I know government has the, the plans of relocating these people somewhere on the hillside. But you know, as I said earlier on, that does take a little time to get things, the logistics and so on. And the people themselves are willing to move? Well, obviously, I don't see any reason why they shouldn't, because they're, moving, they're asking them to move from a danger zone to a safer, safer area. would you, um, if you were to rebuild your house, would you come back and live in this area again? No, I wouldn't be able to stay there because I know the condition where I pass through, so I might take a risk to go higher up or on top of a hill or something. So. There has been help for some victims of Tropical Storm Debbie. An organization calling itself Caritas, a Catholic aid agency, has put in place a loan mechanism to finance small home repair. So uh, persons who are seriously affected by the storm, um, they can get up to $3,000 on a loan basis and then within three years to be repaid. George Williams is also suggesting another solution. The Ancillary Association for Development should finance the repairs. It's not something which is 
easily accepted by the community, especially by some of the members on the association, because it means that you're committing yourself to about $50,000 to repair houses for one or two persons within the community, and therefore the onus of paying back is on us, so people are not too sure, they're not too confident about this. But the real victims of the disaster have received a little help so far. Much has been promised. Aaron Monroe says his name is on every list compiled by those with intentions to initiate help. Ancillary suffered some infrastructural damage. While the jetty appeared to have been spared, the fisheries facility was affected. A region river undermined its banks, exposing the community's vulnerability. But the task of repairing the infrastructure is very much in evidence. At the moment, um, you may realize that there is some work being done. At least to again realign the river bank and realign the, 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 um, the, 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 um, the river in general. In spite of all what's been happening, there is still some nervousness over Ancillary's ability to handle another flood on the scale of Tropical Storm Derby. And since that time, you think enough has been done? No, enough has not been done. Enough has not been done. We are still careless. Enough has not been done about that. We will take a break now, and when we return, we recognize a man who may have saved the lives of many of the community's elderly. Vianney Gonzag grew up in the community of Ancillary, having strong connections with the church. He was instrumental in launching the scout movement in Ancillary and played football with the Foundation Sports Club. Today he is Officer Gonzag. Vianney remembers September 10, 1994. It was a quarter to six when the alarm was raised. The community was being flooded. Vianney took one look outside and did not believe his eyes. I was surprised to see that my first two steps were covered with water and the last step was halfway through. You know, I was shocked. <laughs> I was shocked. Yeah. And um, from that time on, well, I was so confused that I didn't know exactly what to do, whether the water was coming in or whether it would have stopped. Vianney's immediate concern was for his son, Vianney Jr., who lived with his grandmother in Lagocola. But very early on, Vianney Jr. was moved to safety, and so Officer Gonzag went into his rescue mode. Before I left my home, what I did, I put my camouflage uniform, my boots, my t-shirt and my, not the jacket, but the t-shirt and my trousers, okay, so that people could identify me as a police and then they could have called on me. Um, when I step out, well, I moved in the area, the other police officer and myself, then we started moving around, going at people's home, taking them out, some told us that, well, the house is empty because most of the police were taken to the Ansariam Catholic Church. Using ropes and a small boat, Officer Gonzag and other young men from the community set about rescuing those trapped in their homes by the rising waters. Vianney remembers risking his life to save an elderly couple whose home appeared headed for the sea. I was a little fearful. So what I did, we could not have gone to the house. Okay, so I went by the fisheries complex to look for a rope so that we could tie it to a coconut tree that was close by then tie it to the house so that we can get into it to take the people out. But um, <laughs> when I was about going to the complex to get a rope, there was a, a hole about 10 feet deep. I didn't know because the water was very high. So when I tried to jump from the street to the complex, I found myself down into the hole. I was buried beneath the water. But then my hand was up, so I was able to hold the, the surface, and then I get out. We were able to tie the rope to a coconut tree that was close by. Then we form a chain with our hands, we stretch, erect our hands, we form a chain. Then one of the guys tied the rope to the house. Then we were able to help the elderly take them out from the house. And then I carried the, the wife from her home to the church. And then I came back to meet the fellas to get the husband out. And, uh, well, by that time, there were other, another old lady in the area 
So we had the use of the boat where we put a husband and the other lady and then we tried to pull the boat out so that the people could go to safety. Viani knew the rescue operations were high risks, but he's been trained to serve his community. He knew the conditions were difficult and dangerous. I was just saying to God, well, if the rain persists and the water continues to rise, then that's it for us. <laughs> because Ansari is in a, a location where there is a river in the entrance, a river in the exit, and a main one in the center. And if the, the rain had continued, well, there wouldn't be any way out for us. And so we recognize Vianney Gonzag. When we come back, the siege on High Street, Denry. From the west, we head east. Until Derby, when persons in Denry heard of any storm systems, their first concern was the threatening pounding waves. But on September 10, 1994, the sea appeared to be the least of the worries. This time it was water from the interior of the island which threatened to wash away residents right along the beachfront. Tropical storm Derby dumped in excess of 10 inches over the mountain ranges to the west. The Mo River overflowed its banks, flooding the already swampy interior of the village and flowed onto High Street, the main thoroughfare. As the water came from Iran, it could not find its way through the sea and diverted its, its attention to the Denry Cemetery. The wall fell down. Um, we have already, the minister already spent some about over $25,000 plus on the cemetery and then when the river came, it went down the walls. Then the water came through the Denry Plain field into Victoria Street and into St. Peter Street and so on. The morning of Tropical Storm Derby transformed Denry. It was utter confusion as residents sought to recover from the shock of being taken completely off guard. No one expected too much flooding in so little time. When I get up in the morning, the whole place was full of water and we couldn't come out because it was too high and people had to take um, a rope to tie me to get me out <laughs> because I was really frightened. Most of the water which flooded Denry came from the Mole River and so it was expected that this house belonging to Patricia President, a shop owner, will be the first to be overwhelmed by the floodwaters, forcing her to think seriously of moving permanently to higher ground. I was thinking of leaving. That was the first thing come to my mind, but as it passes, the wound a bit healed. So I'm still there. Uh, give us some indication. How high was the water and how widespread was it? Mm. The water was in the street, from the river to the street. You couldn't tell if I didn't build the house in the middle of the riverbed. And it was running so fast. Mrs. President may have to thank her builder for surviving Tropical Storm Debbie. Patricia President lived many years in England. When she and her husband decided to retire in St. Lucia, they asked the builder for designs for a house near the Mole River. But when he came, luckily, water was on the land so he put it hand pillars told us that water was on the land it's a good thing because i think i would be at the bottom of the sea mm. when the water started rising in denry certainly the carefully selected emergency shelters were not safe 
Many persons were rushed to the Denry Roman Catholic Church. The use of boats to get people out of their homes because the water was maybe more than about five feet high in some areas. And call it almost half the village was underwater on this day. The residents on the east of High Street are fortunate Tropical Storm Debbie did not trigger strong winds and high seas. There would be little those on the beachfront could do to keep out the pounding waves. Since Debbie, some residents along the waterfront have been forced out. Others are awaiting relocation by government. And that is taking some time. Because government probably would have to acquire land. That will take time. You need the surveys, got it by lots and so on. Then you need to clear the area. You need to give them a more um, water, you need to give them roads, then you need to give them uh, utilities. So this takes time, and at the moment a committee has been formed, and the mines were in place. The village of Denry has a well-developed fishing industry. A new facility for the fishermen of that community was completed recently, with much help from the Japanese government. That facility was designed to provide proper shelter for fishermen and their boats. But many believe the fisheries complex may have minimized damage to the waterfront. I certainly believe, and that view is shared by many, that if this facility was not around, the sea would have, would have caused a lot more damage. So it has really worked um, in the benefit of the community. Major works are going on to strengthen the banks of the Mo River. A wall is being built along the northern bank with teeth found from a nearby quarry. The wall will be two meters high and the top level will be three meters wide. The engineers say the wall is compacted to withstand a tremendous amount of water pressure and the other side will be lined with rocks. Many residents expressed concern when the now traditional Gabian baskets did not materialize in this project. But engineers say only the area around the home of Patricia President will be lined with Gabian baskets. At the head of Mole Hole, just by the bridge on the highway, behind that lot, there is heavy erosion, and what is proposed to be done there is to lay Gabian baskets to a height of four meters to protect that house and land there. Mm -hmm. It would only be for 50 meters, just behind that particular lot, no further. Mm -hmm. But for the rest of it, you wouldn't need a Gabian bank? No, we will be soaping the banks of the river and lining it with rock. There will be a rock protection. So how much water do you think this will be able to withstand? For example, like if we have another tropical storm Debbie? It will be able to withstand another experience like Debbie because it has stood the test of the heavy rains we have had recently and we had expected some amount of erosion but there was no erosion whatsoever. So at least the people in Denmark can feel a little relief that this river is there? They already felt the relief because they thought not finishing the wall and at the height we were that the river banks would have been over flooded again, but that was not the case. Tropical storm Debbie may have made a mess out of the homes of many residents of Denry, but it did not kill the community spirit to improve the quality of life in the village. An outstanding example of community support in times of distress was the clearing of the Erad water intake serving Denry. Assistant Superintendent of Police, Osbert Regis, who lives in Denry, remembers the public meeting the night before asking for help to clear the water intake, which had been covered by landslides. The following morning, um, some 80 persons showed up with tools ready to work. Um, that activity continued um, for four days, and within eight days of the passage of Tropical Storm Debbie, we had the water supply in Denry fully restored. If Wasa had to come into play, it would take about a month and a half. So what the committee does is to mobilize members of the public, which was very great, because I can recall a note that showed we had about 75 men on that first day at Erad, where we have the, 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 water, the water catchment. They were supported in terms of food by the local community. Um, the shopkeepers, the business people within Denry supported that move.
and I feel that um, the people feel there is a need for the committee to be there and they are also willing to serve on the committee. But like all other disaster preparedness committees, the group in Denry has a problem of inadequate equipment and material to deal effectively with emergencies such as Debbie. In terms of um, stretchers, blankets and things like that, and we are um, at the moment trying to get some kitchen utensils and, and other things like that. We have available a, a cooker. These are basically things that we will need. In spite of this deficiency, the Disaster Preparedness Committee feels the community is sufficiently sensitized and aware of the basic drills of disaster management. If there is one lesson, very important lesson that I learned during the Debbie issue is that community spirit is alive and well in Denry. ASP Regis was raised in the community of Denry and after leaving school he taught there and then went on to the teacher's college where he graduated in 1982. He returned to Denry to teach for one year and then he joined the Royal Fellowship Police Force simply because it was more challenging. He progressed up the ranks quite quickly and today is in charge of the Special Services Unit. During that time, ASP Regis has shown deep interest in disaster management, acquiring top qualifications in that field. He had the great distinction this year of being one of two Caribbean instructors to introduce a disaster management program in the South Pacific Islands. ASP Regis has also been conducting disaster management training in Denry, where there are many untrained volunteers. Um, we have started on a training program and we hope by the end of this season and um, certainly for next, um, next year we will have the community trained, especially the key players in disaster management in Denry will be fully trained to handle whatever situation that comes up. When Tropical Storm Debbie hit St. Lucia, ASP Regis was trapped in Denry and so he sees the opportunity to help mobilize rescue and rehabilitation work in that community. In that one moment, he saw the benefits of his training as a teacher and law enforcement officer. So I think that my background as a, as a trainer has definitely assisted me in the way I deliver my, um, my services to the community. ASB Regis was also honored by the Rotary Club for service to the community. And so we recognize ASB Osbert Regis. When Tropical Storm Debbie left the shores of St. Lucia, it carved the trail of death and destruction in Fort Saint-Jacques, a community high up in the hills around Soufre. Fort Saint-Jacques is surrounded by steep slopes and this could only spell bad news for the community during a prolonged downpour, as was the case with Tropical Storm Debbie. No video pictures of the morning of September 10th were available, but these were the first pictures shot after the storm. The destruction seemed to be everywhere. perished in the disaster. Two were covered by landslides. They were both children. The third, a man in his late 50s, was swept away by a landslide. His body was later found almost half a mile downriver. Marcellus Joseph will be 34 on September 10th. He is a self-employed mechanic working at his shop on Boulevard Street. His friends call him Moa, the dead. September 10th, 1994, Marcellus got up and heard the torrential rains and being self-employed 
and the day being his birthday, he thought there was no real reason to leave for Saint Jacques and head to Souffre for work. His cousin who lived with him had gone out investigating reports of landslides. Marcellus remained in bed, and before he knew what was happening, he felt the walls collapsing around him. It seemed like an entire hillside had pinned him down. Marcellus was trapped and couldn't move. By then his cousin had returned and was trying desperately to free Marcellus, but they were trying in vain and Marcellus knew it. So at time I feel that I couldn't make it, I wouldn't make it, so I tell them, don't you worry. So most of them I'll die there. And then by the time for, them to, for me to tell them that, one of them just noticed the landslide is coming down. So he called on the other one, he said, move. So they had time move, and then the landslide, it took me, the first one, the second landslide, it took me and then went down to the road, and then I get covered underneath the mud and different things that came down. They had a lot of mud and water. It came and it covered me, so what they could see from me down underneath the thing, it's only my feet, and then one of them, they come, and they, I feel somebody hold me, and they start pulling me. And from there they took me, they wet me, all well, that's what I know. And then after that, they took me down, taking me down to the hospital and then... Marcellus was discharged one day later. He was told there was nothing wrong with him. But a few days later he noticed his thighs were swollen and discolored. Friends took him to St. Jude's Hospital in Beaufort. Two operations and 28 days later he was sent home. But it took him a long time before returning to the spot where he was almost buried alive. But there were others who had a date with destiny. This is the area where two people perished. A rural constable by the name of Evans Prosper had stepped outside his house in this area to cut a small drain for water which was flowing into his kitchen. Prosper apparently never knew what happened as a huge landslide swept him away into a river. He was taken downstream. His body was discovered almost half a mile downriver. That landslide completely destroyed the house in which Prosper lived. A neighbor's house was also overwhelmed, and trapped in that house was Justus Jabatis and 10-year-old Paul Mickey. Paul Mickey lived with his grandmother. That Saturday morning, she left the two boys in the house and headed for market in Soufre. Justus and little Paul Mickey were in the same room when the hill burst open. The little boy was lying down, but I was not lying down. I was still there watching the water and the landslide, the second landslide is mash up us. So when the mash up us, me and the little boy, he called me, called me. So when I called him, he answered me two times. When I don't hear him, so I have to try to escape. So when I walk on my belly, and I reach by the little house that there, by, by, and I walk on my belly, and I call my brother, and he gone call people. Among the persons who received the alarm was Paul Mickey's grandmother, who was down the road. Heavy rain and flooding had prevented her from going to Souffre or returning home. I was in the village. 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 I was in the Gasso ama de mwen ki les ki la, mwen di se Justos e pi mi ki. Bon, pon a jale, nou pies pa sa, pa se ale. Bon sa e a se jis, am li di mach, yo vin ti we, ti mama e la, an baka e la. Se plis mwen sa di, plis mwen pa te do ti man la, an di da ka e la. Justos Jabardis at 25 has been buried twice by landslides. In 1981, he was trapped during Hurricane Allen and spent a night stuck in thick mud. He was rescued the following day. Paul Mickey Francis had no such luck. And he said, I'm a good person for me. Because he was here, he was here. He was here, he was here, he was here. He was here, he was here. My husband and I went down and we came downstairs um, lighting a little fire and we heard a funny noise like a helicopter. He asked me, what do that? So I said, it's a helicopter. So I came out from at the back and looking here to watch out there, I saw the whole hill coming down. They had a coconut tree and a, um, 
bread for three. I saw it swept out going down so, and we had to run. We had to cross another river there and run up the hill. And whilst we were up there, a fella came and told us how all the house down there go. go. So I asked him about mine. He told me, well, mine is there, but um, the other fella, Zukong and um, Messian, house swept out, and we asked for them, and they say, well, Coco was in the house. He's alive, but Nikki is dead. It was a, a sad moment, yeah. Like most other women in the community, Magdalene Japol got up at 4 on Saturday morning and prepared to head for a market in Sufre. But the persistent rains changed her mind. As day broke, reports were already circulating of landslides and serious damage to homes all over Font Saint Jacques. Her husband, Ruben, went out to investigate and to assist those in distress. Magdalene Japol was left behind with the children. She was seven months pregnant. <laughs> Magdalene blacked out after the second landslide hit her house. Somebody had smelling salts on hand and revived her. Neighbors and rescuers work feverishly in extremely muddy and dangerous conditions, trying to free the children from the slabs of concrete and mud. No one seemed to know of the whereabouts of 13-year-old Terencia Alexander, affectionately called Anaya. Magdalene Japol could not fathom just what happened. Et puis c'est le 
Before we move on, we must recognize John Pierre Louis. He is 40 years old. He played a major role in the rescue operations at the home of Magdalene Japal. He was one of the first young men into the house. He got in through a glass window at the back. For the next few hours, he helped dig out the family of Magdalene Japal. And so we recognize John Pierre Louis. And one more note, Magdalene Japal gave birth to troublesome Kenayas. The tragedy in Fort Saint Jacques has galvanized residents of the isolated community to take their disaster preparedness committee seriously. Moses Auguste and other people from the community, having seen just how helpless Fort Saint Jacques had become in such a short space of time, decided to revive the committee, which had ceased to exist after its main members left for studies overseas. The main task of this community is to give relief in case of any mishap or disaster which takes occurred in this um, community to see that the people who get affected get um, they need what they are deserve, you see, and also to see well to mobilize the community to prepare themselves for in case of any disaster will be taking place. When the disasters hit Fort Jacques, there were no emergency items to care for the wounded. The disaster committee is still without an emergency kit. We haven't got nothing, not even a bandage, if anything happened. We aren't plastered, we aren't something like that. And where we have a place to go to show the people if anything happened to them. With the landslides occurring all along the road to Fort Jacques, communicating with other communities was almost impossible. And now the Disaster Preparedness Committee believes two-way radios, first aid kits and blankets must be available in the event of a disaster. Another life-saving item is rope. Most of the rescue operations were conducted by using rope bridges. The ropes we use is especially for rope bridges, rope bridges so that we could cross the river because here has many rivers. And in order, if in case where well, all bridges gone, We'll use the road bridges so that we could cross to other sides. Although it appears there's hardly a place in Fort Saint Jacques that can be considered safe, some persons may have to live elsewhere, and so the community needs help in relocating persons living in areas prone to landslides. Well, the assistance we mostly get is from Red Cross. It's Red Cross who assists us a lot, you know, in helping out to find um, getting reliefs for the people food, clothes, and then the shelter was the houses which was built for four of the people who lost their houses. But so far we haven't got any more assistance from government or other sources. But Several persons from the cross-section of the community, as far as from Mini up, up this way and down to Wav in Clare, all the sub-communities in the area, you have at least one person who is training first aid. Um, another thing is to keep the committee going. They have also um, taken part in several different activities, even in community development. Uh, most of the members of, that, of the Disaster Preparedness Committee is also involved in the Community um, Development Committee. So you find that they are always active and the people are aware that things are happening. Also there is regular meetings and so forth and they keep the people informed so the people know that they are there and they can access them anytime that there is a, a need for it. Dominic Prosper is also the chairman of the Fort Jacques Development Committee. 
He wants to see an education campaign to reduce the amount of garbage that is dumped into rivers, causing the unwelcome diversion of water into nearby homes. The practice of slash and burn is also worrisome. But now, Fonce Jacques appears to have a bigger concern. It's coming from a lake located at the top of a hill overlooking the main settlement. The members of the Disaster and Development Committees took a trek to the top of the hill heading for an area called Litang. Whenever it rains, this scenic basin or valley gets flooded, and therein lies the cause for worry. Because this area is pretty flat and it's surrounded by hills, when there is uh, any torrential amount of rain, the whole place gets flooded to a very high level. And uh, because this area in itself is higher than the village of Fonce saint jacques in, uh, in respect, a lot of the water which builds up here seeps below, below ground level and it, it torrents itself under the underlying layer onto Fonce saint jacques And there are places within uh, the Fonce saint jacques community where you can virtually see the water actually gushing through at a tremendous amount of rate. And because the water can seep so easily, it just goes to show that the top layer of here just cannot be stable enough for so much water to be able to come through. And one can imagine that uh, obviously the pounds per square inch of pressure exerted uh, above here and what the potential disaster could be if ever it was to boost its banks or, or come down here in any way. It would just wipe out the whole of the area of St. Jack in one swoop. And so the committee members are hoping to get the community, especially owners of the land at Leitang, to find ways of draining the water. Fonce Jacques, a community built on self-help, isn't waiting for someone else to see about the problem. But the Angkor project has been contacted for advice and help. Disasters don't discriminate. All it takes is one day, one night, one moment. Good night. Because we ask for more material, we want plasters, we want something like that. We was that was when she met Baba. My land on my Adam Kino Mosopi. We have a Iris. We should be going. I'm waiting on my Madisla Dien Kotanaya. My mom and my Chinese. Back in Mosai, back in Mali, I came from back in Nigeria. Only last night, I was a bit um, apprehensive about, about the way things were going because there was a very heavy downpour. People had to take a um, rope to tie me to get me out. <laughs> there was not so much panic because the main thrust at the time was to get out of the water. Community spirit is alive and well in them. Well, in Denver, 